Tuesday's session with Tyler we've kind of filled in at the last minute, so we'll wait just a minute. Yeah. We have lots of good examples, and it's uh, yeah. We'd like to get to know you guys a little bit. Well, I recognize one face in the crowd here. Um, so, how many of you have used Elk Stack before, or okay, so extensively? And you feel like you're gurus, or kind of just getting started? Yeah. So, what is everybody's home? What, what's, what's your experience? You? No, what level? is your what are you experience? comfortable with? I've heard about it. Okay. You've heard about it. You've heard about it. Okay. Is it? Is that the general feeling? We're kind of getting started with it? Okay, good to know. I'm using uh, Elasticsearch for applications right now, oh, but cool. I kind of want to get into using it for monitoring our logs. So Perfect. That's, okay. that's, you're in the right spot. Good. Um, what was I going to say? <laughs> yeah, so, I was, so some people like to keep the, the questions until the end of the session, but we'd like this to be a little more interactive since... Uh, yeah, let's Since stop. Let's stop and and you know cover whatever questions you have at the time we're doing it. We're we're not digging into any of the any real detail. We won't be showing any configs up here, for example. But afterwards, if you want there, to talk about there's a session that. for that at 1:30 in this same room um, with uh, the afternoon session right? with it's people who actually work on Elasticsearch and Logstash. So so that'll so be So they've great. got data sets and configs that they don't mind sharing. Um, my employer would probably fuss at me. Yeah, we've got some lot. NDAs, otherwise <laughs> we'd, be, we'd be doing a lot of other fun live demos and whatnot. But um, I don't know how much longer you want to wait until we get yeah. started. So the guys yeah. who just came in, how, how, where are you in your log stash, elastic search experience level? Experience. You guys get uh, started? Newbie. Yeah. Yeah. Just okay. getting started? Got it, got it installed somewhere, but haven't done it. Okay. Okay. Good. Part, a big part of what we're what we're kind of really presenting about is how easy it is to actually find some value in this thing and give some kind of ideas and some cool stuff that we've we've experienced as we've as we've worked with this. Mm -hmm. So this sounds like you guys are kind of at the right level. We yep. we, we presented at the at the um, Elastic Search meetup. Um, and they were all three pros. weeks ago, and they were all like, you know, they've been using it for years, so it was a little yeah. bit, it was a little bit empty level for. We're like, we'll skip this this part. It's like you've all seen this slide, you don't know how this works. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So okay, and so are, are most of you uh, DevOps or sysadmins or what sort of backgrounds are we from? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, this is for you because we're we're directing it at why everyone in Dev, uh, DevOps and sysadmin can use this stuff, yeah. and like you said, get value really early. It's not as torturous as you might think. No, that's a, yeah, yeah. Or closer we to the actual time. We've got two minutes. Yeah. Well, like I said, yesterday with Tyler's thing, he, uh, like, pretty filled in with the last minute, so. Yep, he's got one. I haven't plugged in anywhere. Um, we're we're going to leave it there. There's just three of us. Yeah. Uh, we're 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 the three of us are all yeah, different sections. Yeah. So okay. He's kind of, Thanks for checking with us, though. We'll, we, will, we will speak towards it. Oh. Okay. Makes me think of a great scene in, in uh, uh, Singing in the Rain where she has her microphone stitched to her shoulder at the beginning of talkies. She says, I can't make love to a bush. So she, they end up putting the microphone in all kinds of crazy places to try to have her talk to it, and you can't hear her. So we'll be in that <laughs> stage. But yeah, that works. So Brian, you have something to say? Talk yeah, I'm just the introduction. Excellent. Well, fire away, Brian. Okay. We'd like to thank you for coming to Open West today. Uh, we'd also like to thank our sponsors. This room is being sponsored by Bluehost and Coco. Turn over to them. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Shall we get started? Yeah. yeah. Far away. <clears throat> we'll be trading off kind of the, the three of us. So this really started out, well, I'm Russell Havens. Um, I, I, I do monitoring at Adobe um, up at the point of the mountain. So my, my, my infrastructure, which is largely Nagios, but moving towards a much richer um, um, stack. Open TSDB stack yeah. is um, we monitor about fifty thousand servers internally and another two to five thousand in the cloud. Um, I teach as an adjunct at BYU uh, and uh, I've been consulting. I've been doing I've been doing stuff for a while. I've been in ops a long long time as well as development and consulting and stuff. Yeah. Hayden. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Hayden. Um, I just graduated from BYU where I was an undergraduate researcher in this stuff. I'm also very active in the open source community, so we know David from working with stuff. Um, and I'm working for Adobe now up at the point of the mountain. 
um, using we're going to start using this stuff in our daily work. So as we ask, as we go over things, feel free to ask questions. I've given this presentation lots of times with lots of different people, and everyone has a different basis for all the questions. So ask away, so we can tailor it to you. Yeah, and I'm I'm Tanner Lunn. Worked on the same projects with Hayden. Uh, in the research lab for the IT department. It's a pretty cool program. We get a lot of hands-on stuff in the undergraduate. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the project we've been working on a little bit later. But, uh, but yeah, so we'll go ahead and get started. Yeah, Carl. So we'll be trading off a little bit. This is the obligatory, this is the one we blasted through at when we were with everybody else. It's the kind of the general picture, right? You've got all these, you've got all of these sources of log entries. So we're, we're going to be talking largely about Log analysis um, in an operations kind of a, kind of a role. Um, obviously, um, the Elasticsearch is a search engine, and it works great for lots of different purposes. But I'm an ops guy, so the thing I care about is that I keep my systems up, that I know whether they're healthy or not. I can tell when there are problems. I can troubleshoot quickly. All of that kind of stuff. So. Um, I played with Splunk a few years ago, and it was really cool, and it got really expensive really fast. And being a monitoring guy means I, I know that the products, the commercial products in my space, you start at fifteen to fifty thousand dollars and then move up from there. And the open source projects, you, that's what we tend to use a lot of. That's why, even though it's kind of crappy, um, Nagios is the cornerstone. Everybody in the monitoring space has used Nagios because it's free to start up with and it's fle quite flexible and can do a lot. Um, well, this is far better. <laughs> And it's quite flexible and can do a lot and, and adds quite a bit to it. So um, we'll be talking about kind of these different pieces a little bit in, in, a, in a few minutes. And then we'll um, give some examples, a lot, uh, a lot of examples. Okay. Okay. So my background with, with this stack. So I've, I've been a developer. I've done web dev. Um, I've, I've written code for a lot of years. And, you know, the standard way you find stuff, quite honestly, is although it's really awesome to be able to have, you know, JMX and beautiful frameworks to provide stuff, most of the time I end up writing just logs. And, you know, my programs start out with print to screen, and then when they become a web app, then I'm writing to, I'm using Log4j or whatever logging framework I'm using, but I'm writing out logs to kind of figure out the status of what's going on. As an ops guy, which is what I mostly have done, I'm an ops guy who codes really, rather than the other way around, um, that logs are absolutely invaluable, absolutely crucial. I was up till um, just after midnight last night digging through logs to figure out what uh, an issue that we had in our infrastructure. Um, so one of the things that I found that's interesting is that in a lot of the organizations I've worked in, operations guys, they're very ad hoc about how they use logs. We go to the box. We grep and we do some manipulation to find the stuff we're looking for. We last and search for it or whatever. The ones who are really formal about how you use how you use um, the logs and collecting it and making sure that it's curated and that it's taken care of is usually InfoSec. It's the information security team, and those guys don't share very nicely. I've noticed, and so even though they have these great systems and they've They've ponied up the budget for Splunk or whatever. They don't share with us. <laughs> and so I'm stuck with grep, um, which is you know, great when you've got a smallish infrastructure. When I was at Novell, I had 1,500 servers. When I was at Family Search, I had 5,000 servers. Now I've got 50. OK, well, that's great, unless you want to see across multiple servers. Um, so for me, this was that. That aspect of it made me really interested in um, in the log stash Elasticsearch kind of world starting oh maybe three years ago. Um, so I I personally view this as a monitoring functionality. It's commonly, like I said, used in used in um, used in for you know uh, infosec kind of stuff. Um, but monitoring is such a broad area. Ha even having something to somebody define monitoring, as a monitoring guy, having people define monitoring, like everybody has an opinion about it, and, it's, and everybody's opinion is slightly different. Um, I like to break it into these three areas. 
Um, we've got kind of up down, that's kind of the Nagios world. We've got historical, that's kind of the MRTG, open TSDB, kind of gra graphite kind of a world. And then we've got log analysis, which is kind of a different beast in its own way, right? It's not numerical. Um, it's, it's quantitative, not qualitative, it's qualitative, not quantitative, right? Um, this is a space that is really underutilized. Um, so I um, finished a master's at BYU in log file analysis maybe six, five years ago, something like that. And um, they asked me to, la last year they asked me to head up a capstone team that would work on some log analysis um, for OIT and the FBI. Um, so I worked with the capstone team, which is kind of the senior graduating um, students, um, to put together a system and start doing some, some work on it. And that's what started, that's, that's the stuff that started out as the infrastructure that these guys work with. Yeah. Um, we had a fun little ride um, in the IT department over our senior year, not for a capstone, but we were the successor to the capstone. It went well enough that the Office of the Information Technology on campus um, decided they wanted it. They wanted it tested and they wanted it implemented. And so they talked to us in, in, the, uh, in the infrastructure lab uh, in the IT department to, to deploy something on a larger scale to see if it was feasible to, to monitor everything across BYU campus. That's a lot of stuff. Um, so this became, I mean, on a, on, a, uh, on a campus, you have a lot of data to deal with. I mean, right, you can see it here. There's servers, there's SANs, there's network equipment, there's Wi-Fi hotspots, there's, uh, there's uh, IDSs, there's all sorts of stuff. And um, the volume is high, the diversity of the types of logs you can get is high. Um, a lot of things come in syslog, but I don't know if you've noticed, um, but not everyone follows syslog the way they're supposed to either, right? Um, it's, it's kind of semi-structured data when you're dealing with something like Elasticsearch or Logstash, or just logs in general. Um, even if following just one standard, not everything's going to fit into the same columns. And that's why you need something like Elasticsearch or, or Apache Solar um, or, or Splunk if you've got the money for that, um, that can search over this data and make it useful. Um, we started with something very small and then expanded to be fully production uh, capable. We started with, uh, with just this. So these are just core i7 little desktop boxes that were retired from some of the labs, um, early i7s. And actually there's a couple core 2 duos in the bottom there. And um, this was our whole uh, elk stack. There's our log stash ingester, which is the silver box, and then a bunch of Elasticsearch nodes, and one of them was running the... Uh, the web post with Kibana on it. This was able to handle uh, a very large portion of BYU campus traffic. And that's the good news, and that's kind of the, the, the things we want, want to emphasize, that you can get started and you can get value. Um, you can get a system that can ingest a large amount of logs for cheap. Once you get larger and you need more reliability, for example, um, you can scale up, but you can start with something like this. You know, you don't have to ask for thousands of dollars in blade servers. Um, to give you an idea of, of the volume, these numbers are out of date, by the way. They've, uh, little, they've uh, more than doubled at this point. Um, but at the time we made this slide deck, which was a couple months ago, uh, every 60 seconds we were ingesting over 2,000 network logs, 430,000 IDS logs. Most of those were from wireless access points. Um, you got wireless logs, 62 million logs a day. Now it's uh, what? Well, yeah, almost double. It's over. Uh -huh. It's over 200. Over 200. Uh, over 200 million logs. How many gigs is that? Oh, that's that's in the terabytes. It, it comes out to being almost a terabyte a day worth of logs. Um, so we have to rotate them. We only keep them alive for about a week, and then they offload to slower spinning disk storage or tape or wherever they want them, just because. Yeah, well, that's one of the balances and, and flexibilities with, with this sort of system is um, if you've got the money, yeah, get the storage because we can fill up storage quickly. But if you don't have the storage, just keep the index logs for a shorter window of time and then you can close them and move them off or, or delete them entirely. So um, one of the things I'll, I'll, I'd like to mention um, is, that, um, is that Logstash, when it, when it inserts into Elasticsearch, it does it into a daily 
um, into a daily index. So you can manage them by day. Um, I pulled off the net a, a, little, a little script that basically calls out and deletes older entries by day. So I, so I age mine out, mine's at 60 days on my infrastructure. So the cool thing is, is that because, because each index is by day, you can manage, you can say I need 60 days or I need 90 days or I need three days or whatever it is, and it's really easy to just clean them off or to, you can quiesce those particular ones and tell them to not take any RAM, even though they're on disk space. So there are a number of management mechanisms they provide for you for that. Yeah, there's a lot of flexibility. And additionally, um, your log sources, you can send them to different indexes as well. So even if you're doing just an index a day, you could have an index for your wireless logs and an index for your IDS logs and, and split them out separately So because maybe you need to keep one longer than the other. So you have a lot of options with that. And uh, we were able to ramp up to this pretty quickly. We started with, like I said, those core i7 boxes. Then we went to some VMs. Uh, on an ESX infrastructure because that's what BYU has. Um, do you remember off the top of your head the number of VMs we're running right now? Right now. Yeah. About, about 20 data nodes, 15 other nodes. Okay, 20 data nodes, 15 other nodes. We'll talk about what that means a little bit more later. But you can scale up pretty well and it works well both on physical boxes and on uh, VMs. Word of caution if you're going to use VMs. Um, certain VM tools like ESX um, will do dynamic allocation of, of compute and of, of RAM and of storage. Um, but Elasticsearch, since it is built for clustering out, you, when you need more space or, or uh, more resources, you just add another node. It does resource management as well. And if you've got the VM um, controller and Elasticsearch <coughs> both trying to do resource management, it will die. <laughs> Let Elasticsearch manage the resources. Give it static boxes that are going to have a certain clear amount of RAM. I think the other rule of thumb is you only want to give half half your, your box's RAM worth t um, of heap to the Elasticsearch JVM on any given node. Elasticsearch runs in Java. Logstash, um, which is our parser and indexer, is a Ruby program. And, you know, there's other little things you can add on top. It's JRuby. Runs on the JVM. So what were the specifications of the systems that you're running? How many gigs of RAM? What are your VMs look like? Well, well let's, uh, let's go back to this. These, <laughs> like I said, Core 2 Duos and, and Core i7s that were running um, between 8 and 16 gigs of RAM total, which means half as much for, for the, the nodes. And as you can count there, there's uh, 4, 8, 15 nodes and an indexer. Actually, only 14 nodes because one of them was the, was the web host running Kibana. And uh, I think a, uh, a mirror as well. We were, we we're port mirroring data to these, by the way, so that's one solution. If you've already got things going in a centralized location, port mirror off. But it's better if you can just use our syslog and put it that there. So oh, yeah, and then the VMs. The VMs. Okay, before I, I go any further, do you guys under, have you guys played enough around to know the differences between the three different Elasticsearch boxes plus your indexers and your web server in the back end? you guys done enough of if, that to understand? If not, we'll do that. Okay, we'll so um, when you, what you find is that your data nodes are your most RAM hungry. Uh, your indexers are going to be your most compute. Uh, compute heavy. And your web server just needs to have an open number of connections. Yeah. Um, it what, due to the way that, that the JVM works, you don't want to push your data nodes beyond 32 gigs of RAM. That's the biggest you want to make your JVM heap size before pointers become, um, well, I'm, I'm not the not I'll let the Java guys yeah, right. <laughs> go into the details of it. So 32 is the max. We run each of ours actually around 8 to 16, and we scale horizontally over vertically. So if we need more, we just shove another VM into it, and it'll dynamically take the cluster and reallocate sharding and whatnot across it. So it's really easy to grow it horizontally. Um, so each data node has about 8 gigs of RAM. Each indexer node has about 2 gigs of RAM and 4 CPUs, and the master nodes have a mix depending on what we're doing with each of them. Right. And it, like you said, it's better to scale out horizontally with nodes whose properties you already know. You know how they're going to behave rather than trying to beef them up when there's unpredictable results. So the idea, the cool thing, the reason why sysadmins of all budgets can, can deal with this is you can start with something like this. I mean, maybe not on this particular laptop, but you can run <laughs> it on the laptop. Uh, you can run Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana on one box. It runs on Windows, it runs, it's Java, so it runs yeah. on Windows, it runs on Linux, um, 
I recommend Linux. Linux. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> what, what about cloud server? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any? As long as you've got a, as long as you have a 1.7 or later JVM, you're in good shape. What about resource management between, you know, like hypercloud or something? Like that? As long as you relatively statically allocate your resources, right? Don't let it do the sizing thing. You're fine. Yeah, and I believe most cloud providers we'll talk about mine on the next slide. allow <laughs> allow specifications like that, like you know, infrastructure as a service. You can ask for it to be statically allocated. Just make sure that they are, so that Elasticsearch can do your research man uh, resource management. But um, I would imagine that that of the, those of you who have worked with the Elk stack, uh, many of you have done at least this or something similar to this. Is that a correct assumption? You've gotten to that In, point. You got everything this stuff on one board? Really, really easy. So, first of all, if you're comfortable with Vagrant. There are Vagrant boxes with all this already installed. If you want to just fire it up, there are RPMs, DEBs, tarballs, and source. You can go get the Git repo if you want. Yeah. I use I use the RPMs in my production infrastructure. There are uh, Docker containers. There are um, Juju gems. There's uh, lots of Puppet and Chef cookbooks. Puppet and yeah, Chef. Um, so I believe. Pick your favorite tool. So there's they'll have a package for it. Yep. Does there's Salt have it yet? Getting there. Yeah, it's all has yeah. it well. So there's, there, it's really easy to fire this up on a test VM and, and just play with it. Yeah. What it, would you guys say is the minimum amount of RAM and CPU power? We'll talk about that on the next slide because I'm yes. kind of running there on one couple of my boxes. <laughs> but it's a good point and it's a good question and that's one we didn't know the answer to at first. <laughs> so I, so this is my infrastructure. Mine looks kind of like this. I've got a bunch of. Well, this is recorded for posterity, so I won't actually, I cannot either confirm nor deny that I'm running this in my production infrastructure, but I am using it for Nagios. <laughs> I use my, <laughs> I'm actually watching my own Nagios logs out of this infrastructure. I've got three VMs. One of them has four gigs of RAM and it is struggling. I have to watch this about every week. This cluster goes weird because I've got one node with four gigs of RAM. These only have eight gigs of RAM, so I need to actually size these up. I wouldn't go anything smaller than eight, and it depends on your input. On your input, if you're just doing, if you're just doing, um, relatively few logs, right? So I've got, um, I've got, I think I've got mine trimmed down to 90 days ish worth of logs: syslog, mail log, Nagios log, um, just kind of all the basic logs on my server. Apache on my. 40 or 50 Navia servers, half a dozen MRTG generating boxes, some um, some other web server boxes. Um, I've got 285 million logs in my infrastructure. Like I said, they're three fairly small VMs. I've only got like 80 gigs of disk on each of them, so they're pretty small. Um, and um, I wouldn't go smaller than that. It's RAM for me. And I use I come um, I run log only log stash only on one node, and I'm just I have I'm just using Elasticsearch. I'm not separating out the functions. I just fire up Elasticsearch by default, and it does all the functions, indexing and ingest and all that kind of stuff. Um, and again, I'm pulling from probably maybe all told probably somewhere between 40 and 60 boxes, maybe 50ish. Um, I'm using log stash forwarder, which is a really lightweight Go-based executable. It's actually a binary. And compiled to your platform. This stuff is all Java, so it run wherever. Um, but I just built it on my, it's much more lightweight than a Java thing. So I have it tailing logs and watching stuff. Um, I've got um, Kibana on a, so my, my infrastructure is actually on the other side of a, of a DMZ. So I have to proxy the web, a web interface on it um, to get to the data on it. So I had to do some Nginx fun make it go. But it's not, it's really not bad. You, if, if you've got direct access to your boxes, you fire this thing up um, and point to its port on 9200 and, and you can see stuff. Um, the new version of Kibana, I've got the logo for the older one, but the um, Kibana 4 is actually a Node app, Node.js app. So it fires up. The previous version was you just dropped it in an Apache direct served or a web server directory and pointed a browser at it. So that, um, the new version of Kibana is a little pokey, but it's in release candidate, so um, it, it's kind of you know, it's early. It's it's early, kind of early on. I think I'm 402 actually, and it's a little pokey for me. But that's probably because I haven't upgraded my backends. So questions about sizing or any of that? Yeah, Again, it's pretty. 
it, 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 it was pretty straightforward. I actually started with one box, but as I found various things, and I'm like, oh, if I hadn't had that, I'd never have known about this, this issue. I added more servers into it and ended up with these kind of three nodes. So with the, are any of these master nodes or data nodes, are they doing both? They're, all, they're doing both. And how, much, how many gigs of data are coming in per day? Um, I looked at it yesterday and I cannot remember. Um, it's something like, it's something like, um, I want to say it's something like eight or ten gigs a day, something like that. It's not a lot, mm -hmm. I mean, compared to what these guys are doing. <laughs> have you had any problems with Kibana? No, uh, no, no, uh, especially Kibana 3. Kibana 4, like I said, is kind of pokey, mm -hmm. and I still haven't learned all of the functionality. I only, I only installed it about two weeks ago. Um, and then had to find a free port because they only let certain ports through to our DMZ. <laughs> do you run both versions against the same cluster? I do. Actually, I run both of them. And yeah. most of my kind of, when I'm really serious about digging and stuff, I use the one I'm, I'm used to, which is Kibana 3. And when I want to play around, then I'm using Kibana 4 to kind of get to understand it. Yeah. I'll only add a word of caution about Kibana 4 with the uh, with the rest of your environment if you're going to run 3 and 4. Is uh, Kibana 4 has a minimum version of blog stash and elast well, elastic search that, that is compatible with. That's the newer one, I believe. I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but just check compatibility. That's one, four, two. That's what I'm running. It's yeah, they're, they're, they're starting to smooth it out because these were different open source projects and now they're kind of all under the elastic.co umbrella. So versioning should be a little more consistent from now on. Uh, but just check that because that's, that's something I'd encountered in the past was uh, a little bit of versionitis. Um, so um, going back to this basic idea here is uh, like you asked about master nodes and data nodes for example when you run on a laptop you just run one node that does everything for Elasticsearch and your log stash is there and this is by the way is a great place to do iterative um, development on your on your log stash parsing um, because you're not gonna get it right the first time it's just the way it works I mean I, I love using regex. I, I never love having to figure out so regex. One of the things we probably ought to talk about for just a moment yeah. is where the mindset behind parsing your logs is different here than in Splunk. So if you played with Splunk, don't think Splunk when you're doing log stash will be frustrated. Yeah. In the log stash world, um, as, the, as they come in on ingest, you have a configuration set of log stash that recognizes that basically parses your logs. And that's in Grok. It uses a, it uses a number of libraries, one of which was really super useful, one called Grok. It's essentially um, variables for regex. <laughs> and they've got a bunch of predefined regexes. Now anybody who's done regex knows that you can really get it over your head really quickly. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can get full screen regexes that just recognize whether it's an IP address or not. Yeah, IPv6 is about this big. It's huge. And so they've got this predefined. You just use it as a variable. Dollar IP or host. And so they've got a bunch of that stuff. It's all on ingest. That breaks the, essentially what that does, it takes the log and it breaks it into a JSON with each of the fields broken out as a, as a separate, separate field in the JSON. And then that gets indexed inside Elasticsearch. Then you can do searches on specific fields that you've already broken out. You can do, there's one field, there's, there's a field called message that has everything. So if you didn't get it right, you can still find stuff in there. But it's definitely something you, want, you you put thought into as you pull stuff in. You're like, okay, I'll see which, I'll see what fields I need to be parsing out and putting into that. It's kind of a, in my mind, um, it just takes a little more upfront thought than if you're using something that, that's just straight query. It gives you more power if you think of it upfront as opposed to afterwards. Um, you use Lucene as the query, Lucene's um, query language, which is quite powerful. It does stemming, and I mean, it does a lot of kind of um, munging of the data for its for creating its, its inverse indexes. Mm -hmm. Kibana itself is very powerful, uh, just because it uses the REST API and talks to Lucene, I guess, really. So it's Lucene that's powerful um, for queries, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, all, all the things you're able to find once you've parsed your data. But take into consideration standardized fields as best you can, since logs vary. Uh, in name and in length and, and in convention. They do a great job of handling some of the like timestamp craziness that you find. Oh my goodness, yes. Um, and yeah. Yeah. So um, 
just when you're when you're working on your long stash configuration for for your new deployment or for your production environment, I recommend I mean just grab sample data, stick it in a single one node cluster, try configurations until you find one that works, uh, and then try and stick that in, in production because you won't get it right debugger. the first time. Yeah, I, I love the Grok debugger it's on Heroku. Just search for Grok debug, and you'll oh, yeah. You can paste one line into it, and then it paste in, paste in, start fiddling with um, yeah. regexes. Here's my log. Here's what I think will parse it. Let's see if it actually works. It's great. And they also show you a bunch of the predefined variables and tags so that you can be like, oh, I didn't know that there was one called syslog line that will get most standard syslog formats. Great. Just angle bracket, syslog line, angle bracket. Done. You won't be done if you have lots of logs because someone will not follow the syslog format the way they're supposed to. But it's a good start. Um, and so starting from somewhere small, and this is the common architecture that a lot of people start with and that pretty much most size enterprises can handle. If you want to go big, you can go big. This is big. This is close to what we're doing in OIT. It's the idealized version that we're working towards. Um, so we put in clouds, right? Because that's what managers like to see, the little clouds. So you've got your data sources and then your shippers. Um, which they can be log stash forwarders, or you can just use rsyslog, or there's, there's a lumberjack, there's a number of other tools you can use, um, and direct things in. The nice thing with log stash is it plays really well with Redis. Um, you can also use RabbitMQ or other, other queues, and key value stores of different kinds, but we like Redis. Um, log stash plays really nice and can put things into Redis really easily. So if you have a Redis cluster, right, you make a little failover. Um, you put your logs into there, and that can that can uh, that can be some temporary storage. Well, a queue, right? That's what queues are for. Before you start ingesting them in, into Elasticsearch, if the indexers run behind, or if there's a, a network partition, or any of a number of things, you can lose logs. And uh, sometimes that's not a big deal. If uh, you're having serious memory errors in a core core router, for example, or uh, or there's a, some port flapping that's wreaking havoc with your network. And uh, port flapping shows up everywhere, by the way. That's one of the things this is really good at catching. Um, it's nice to have it in Redis where it will be stored and it won't just get dumped on the floor. Because if you don't have a queue of some kind, anything Logstash doesn't have the availability to take at that moment will be dumped on the floor and you'll lose it. So depending on how robust you want it to be, you can just take that risk. If you don't need you know, five nines of availability for your, for your log cluster, you don't have to worry about it, but this is ideal and it's great. And you stick it in Elasticsearch, which is already a high availability cluster. Yeah, you had a question. Um, so on the indexers, how are you doing more than one log stash indexer? Aren't you getting, from what I've had, if you have two log stash indexers, you'll yeah. get two entries into Elasticsearch. Right, so the you can do a subscription model and you can also uh, just pull from Redis. That's one of the nice things about pulling from Redis is we have different indexers pulling different pieces of the data. So uh, it's not properly redundant. That would be one of the nice things is if Logstash itself was clustered. It's not. So instead, I like that music. Um, uh, instead, we just have different pieces going to different indexers. So if an indexer goes down, we don't lose all of it. We just use, lose part of it. Because you're right. If you put in two indexers just straight up, you'll, you'll get duplicates of the data, and that's, that's no good. Did you want to add anything to that? Uh. Depending on how in depth you want me to go, I can go over how different ways you can cluster stuff like this for um, high resource availability, but it can get kind of nasty depending on how deep you want to go. Probably, yeah. I, I think probably what we want to do is we'll get the examples. So we've got a whole bunch of examples after this, and then we can circle back around here if, any, if anybody wants at the end. Yeah, if this, if this so is what people are particularly interested in, that. we'd be happy to do that. Because um, that is a good question, Our and that's will go pretty quickly. and that is the wink link. I'm, I'm glad you caught it. That is the wink link. Is that Logstash doesn't cluster as well as everything else in the system. It might in the future. Oh, they finally they finally implemented heartbeats in Logstash so that when it starts and stops ingesting, but the the program hasn't actually died, you don't know about it. So with heartbeats, that's been fixed. That's the newest version of Logstash. Uh, and then in Elasticsearch, you've got your three different nodes. I'll go over them quickly. I think, I think a number of you uh, already know the different roles. But with master nodes, um, they're just in charge of administering the cluster, deciding what goes where. Um, you generally want an odd number so that if there's a network partition, you don't have the split brain problem. And uh, something we've implemented in, in, the, in the cluster for OIT is that uh, nodes are not allowed to start up unless they can see two of the masters. Because um, we, we only have three masters there. 
right? So they need to see at least two of the masters um, so that we, we don't end up with different kingdoms and silos of Elasticsearch all over willy-nilly. Um, and you've got your, your data nodes, which you store the data, and it shards it. You can decide how many shards you want to split your data into. Um, default is five, I want to say, but ten's a good number. And then you can decide how many backup copies you want. Uh, it's, by default, it's just one backup copy, but you can have more depending on how robust you need it to be and how much money you have for boxes. Um, the idea with sharding and backups is simply that if you split it into, into shards zero through four, or one through five, however you want to fence post it, um, shard one for, for today's index will never be on the same box as backup shard one, right? That's all there is to it. Just so they will try and make sure that the backup shards for, for an index are not on the same box as the primary shard, so that if a box goes down, you don't lose everything. You've got enough to recover. It's uh, certain I, versions I, of rate. I from the default. I didn't change it at all, so I've got five shards, one backup. Yeah. So Again, I lose a node, it's not a big deal. That's the reoccurring theme. With, with the whole stack, which is why we like it so much. Is you, this can be a simple plug and play or as in-depth, highly tweakable, messing with thread counts as you want. Um, and then this is the old, the old model for Kibana, right? You just got a little box running Kibana and then it pushes out the, the JavaScript framework to your browser and then your browser speaks directly through the REST API with Elasticsearch. Everything with Elasticsearch is through the REST API, which is great, but also there are security concerns and they're not Plan for them, or you will never get those logs from InfoSec like you want. Um, reverse proxies, for example, independent VPNs. Um, the Elastic Company has a tool, we don't use it because colleges don't have money, um, that will, will encrypt the traffic between your nodes and do a number of other things. It's called Shield. They like their Marvel references. Um, um, but new Kibana is, like, like you said, a, a node, Node.js app. Um, with, new, with further releases, it'll become more stable. I think it's more unstable just because they're changing to a totally different model. They've basically recoded everything. Yeah. So my experience, is, my experience with this so far has been not, not that it's unstable, but it's slow. And it's slow. Yeah. And they'll work on that. Yeah. Uh, but it provides secure authentication and some other functionality that you don't have just in a straight Angular JS app. Yeah. Um, I guess we'll circle back for more questions on this because I'm sure there will be plenty because this is fun stuff and we're all DevOps and it's just admins. But uh, we want to talk about the theory, like why you need to do something like this. Um, monitoring is a key part of, of running an enterprise and yes, there's only so many resources and so much network connectivity that you can allocate to it, but it needs to be done. And one of the nice things about log aggregation and analysis is that instead of having to go out and ping things, you already know it's already written down. All, the, all these servers and all these little network devices, they're writing in their journals what they've been up to lately and any problems they've had. And uh, in, in the case of wireless access points, they may or may not also track the MAC addresses that are connecting to and away from them or how many uh, or what type of phones they are for whatever else metrics you want. Um, they're already recording these things. So if they are, you ought to use them. The problem has always been, right, like we mentioned earlier, it takes forever to check one box at a time for logs. I mean, it's the same problem, same idea that configuration management is meant to solve, right? You want to spin up six servers, you don't want to have to go to every single one. You want to look at the logs for six servers, you don't want to have to go to every single one. That's the model. Because monitoring, monitoring is still maturing, it's still pretty young as, as a discipline. I mean, one form or another has existed for a long time, but it's only really now starting to grow up with tools such as this. Um, really, you this is eventually going to be standardized, but you need to be thinking about it holistically. We know this isn't a complete list, but I mean, you've got a lot of different sources of data. You've got SNMP, which is necessary, but cumbersome from time to time. You've got your standard out, you've got slash proc, you've got your stats, IOSTAT, and what else? VMSTAT, VM VMSTAT, all the stuff we live at as admins, right? Right. These are different forms of monitoring information you can get, and logs being the unique one that's auto-recorded and can be auto-shipped off that you don't have to go dig around for or send requests for. Um, system pieces, no matter what your source of data is, you need something that collects it, you need somewhere to send it that's centralized, and you need something that can make heads or tails of it. And uh, Elasticsearch does that, right? That's, that's what the three little letters are in ELK, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. They serve those same three pieces just like you have your agents for Nagios and your uh, 
your controllers and your and your GUIs or, or whatever other metrics you're going to use. Um, and then, so because of that, um, there are some basic principles you have to think about when doing monitoring. The point is to make sure things stay up and to make sure that when things go down, you know where and why, the root cause, and how to fix it quickly. Uh, and there's two aspects to that. There's active, well, reactive and proactive. Reactive being what we're all used to, putting out fires. I mean, no one likes to have to put out fires all the time, but it's kind of just the name of the game. And all these different forms of monitoring in one way or another help you to identify and put out fires. Uh, it's root cause analysis. It's, okay, turns out that a, s a security certificate expired and blew everything up. Um, things of that nature. And yeah, that shows up in the logs too, by the way. Um, and that's all well and good, but it's kind of nice when things don't break in the first place and you don't get called in in the middle of the night, fix things. Miss dinner. Miss sleep. Miss sleep. Uh, so the the idea in general, and the, and elk helps with this, but just in general, is you want to move towards a more proactive form of monitoring, where you can identify potential problems before they happen. Uh, early warning signs show up in the logs days, weeks, months, even years before things actually break. Right. So, um, computers are resilient things sometimes, and they can keep limping along even though there's something seriously wrong. And that's one of the advantages here, is with logs, they're parsed, they're there, they, you can analyze them passively, and you can find problems before everything goes down and alarm bells start going off, um, before certain thresholds are met that mean an email gets sent out. You can dig in with Kibana long before that and identify issues and fix them. We found thousands of issues on BYU campus that the network engineers, even though they do a good job, they were not aware of because things hadn't fallen over yet. And we were able to fix a lot of things quickly. And yeah, it's also useful for InfoSec, but you know, don't tell those guys or they'll be in charge of it. <laughs> or maybe you do want them in charge. Um, any questions about this theory? Basic principles, right? I think we all know this in one way or another. And so, I'm going to let Hayden talk a little bit about the way about the querying and how you actually use this. Why it's useful for sysadmins and DevOps of all levels, no matter the size of your infrastructure, no matter how much space you have for storage, if you're only storing things for 24 hours because you have no hard drive space, or if you've got them on tape backup somewhere. Hayden, Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to try and fly through a lot of this so we can go into some of the in-depth stuff if you guys want to go there. Um, I've done a lot of research into this. I've done a lot of this. I've been, you know, a, I've been a sysadmin for seven years now, and I've spent a lot of 48, 72 hour days fixing crap, and I don't like it, okay? So as ops engineers, we already search for things in our logs. If any of you guys go and grep through your logs, or you dump them all, and you use a vim, or a set, or an awk to find things, you already find things, keywords that tell you what's going on. Things like error, failure, root, port flapping, memory. All these things are keywords that you already know. And you guys probably have lists of them. You know, you might be like me, I have a wiki page, my own personal wiki page that I have that just the terms. If something's going wrong, I have terms that I just chunk through and I search. So we're gonna turn these simple one key searches into useful data. This is a picture from my current uh, log stash to log to search uh, section here. This is over time, this is what makes it nice. So you have here your different days, it comes over time, and we just popped in one keyword, which is memory. Uh, as we come along here, this is a 30-day period. You can see halfway through, the number of logs with the word memory in it increased exponentially. And so you can tell already you have something, something's gone on in your infrastructure. Um, and so this little section here can tell you more about what it is that is wrong with the memory. So here's an example from my infrastructure. I had to kind of redact a few things to make sure it was okay with my, my boss. But, um, so I've got, I've got um, we've got some settings on our Nagios boxes that, that it'll only run a certain number of maximum processes so we don't overload the box. We've found that we can, we can knock over a box if we allow Nagios to paralyze too much. And there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a term, max concurrent connections reached. Um, and I can see that I've got two boxes, two, th this is by, by host, this is uh, these two boxes are far, it's occurring far more often than my other boxes. 
So just by searching on that, I found that I needed to size these two boxes up. Um, I need to add more nodes actually to my Navios cluster. So, which is on order <laughs> now because of this very analysis. Something as simple as just looking for a known, a known phrase that I know uh, represents a problem. Guys, okay, so this is another simple search. Remember we talked about fielding before. One of the fields that you can do is this is exchange logs, all right? And this is IP address by country of received incoming emails. Um, the darker the color, the more you are receiving from that country of origin. So one of the cool things that, that uh, is that you can do geo IP lookups inside of Logstash. So once Logstash recognizes that a certain field is an IP address, you can just say, do a geo IP on that field, and it'll give, it'll give you coordinates that can go into that. Mm -hmm. So from this map, we can see here that we started receiving emails from like the Ivory Coast and Ghana and Nigeria and places like that. And we were able then to look at those emails and find where malware was entering the system. You know, I'm not an InfoSec guy, but I was able to use this and do some of that InfoSec type work by just looking for what is out of the ordinary. Okay, we're, we're BYU, we're based out of Utah. So America should be heavy. These other countries, yes, we have people abroad, but not so much in these areas over here. And so these are things that you can simply just pick up a map and look at and be like, what does my logs tell me about what I'm getting? Now this one's a little cooler. This one is by a GOIP location. You can zoom in on a map and look exactly where, according to, to what we know about IP addresses, where things are coming from. So if we zoom in on, we went over here in Taiwan. We have a professor who's from Taiwan. And there were some emails coming from Taiwan, and we were able to zoom in on the street, and he made the comment that's where his family lives, was in Taiwan on that very street. So we were able to locate exactly where information was coming from, uh, but it's only as good as your public data is. But you can do these. You can do these things and go, well, well I got these suspicious looking, this suspicious looking traffic, and I know the IP address, and it says it's coming from here. What you do with that, that's not, I'm not going to care what you do with that information, but you can get that information. You get simple things like time graphs. This is just overall, this number of logs we collect in a day. You can see the weekend. You can see the weekend on campus is much less. Then you can see where all the students come and they start doing stuff on campus and then they all go home. And we do it again, and we do it again, and we do it day in, and we do it day out. Now what you start to find that is, uh, this one's only a seven day, but if you look at a 30 day about this time period, there was one day of the week where it was almost double the number of logs in that one time period. Now if you've already got a simple history Something that's double what it's supposed to be, you already know you have a problem. Something's occurred, and you need to go look and find out what it is. So here's one that here's one that I'm using, and that same thing. So I'm lo I'm I'm actually watching Nagios logs and, uh, and the notifications as they go out. So and here I've got them here I've got them graphed um, by type, um, whether they're okay, warning, critical, or unknowns. And you can see I had a had a spike here of criticals and a spike of recoveries. Um, as I recall, this one, I've got in the notes there, but as I recall, this one um, was, uh, we had a name server go down that caused a whole bunch of SSL certificate error problems. Um, this stuff shows up in your logs, and again, is quite simple. I just said, in the state field, I actually have some, some logs that pull into a status field because I've got older instances. But in one of these two fields, if it's okay, then do this color. And I can hear, I can do it by percentage, so that I can see that the high percentage of of my logs is, is critical here, or I can do my straight counts, which I put in there. So again, you can kind of see how things are going normally by just, and, and kind of see whether you need to, ah, I need to look at stuff. Yeah, baselining. Yeah. You can do that with machine learning if you want. Okay, so this is another kind of fun thing we're doing, that we're capturing data by phone OS. So you want to know what your heat mapping looks like on your campus, you want to know what it looks like in your building, and what people are using for their phones. So this is general all of campus, you have your iPhones, which is your green, your Androids, which are your blue, and your Windows phone, which is really just that little blip of red there. So, <laughs> yeah, we yeah, yeah. so yeah. this would be that same professor. We know that guy. Club. So we do have some, some Windows phones, and we have a vast majority of things are iPhones, and then we do have some Android phones. This is overall campus. If we go to the next slide, we'll break it down by building, okay? So this is the business school. Of course, iPhone is murdering everyone over there. That's what everyone uses. But this is the administrative building. Here we're seeing that Android is overtaking at times iPhone, and it's a pretty much 50-50 split. Now if you're talking about your infrastructure and what you're supporting, the different protocols you're using, you do care about this information and about where you're going to put equipment within your buildings. Mm -hmm. You do wireless hotspot metrics too. Mm -hmm. 
So this is just another simple bin and count of, of severity. If you want to know, just like you had before, those graphs, this is a different kind. This is just a pie chart. And we can see here the vast majority of our stuff is information on debug. Well, I don't really care about information on the debug, so I trimmed it out. And then I noticed here, this is how everything else breaks down. We have mostly nervous alerts and errors, and then we do have this little sliver of criticals, which it's really not that small. That's 35,000, and this is only from seven days, so we collect a lot of logs. Uh, and that's how our logs are breaking down in severity-wise. And we care if this number changes a lot, because we care about histories. So as we move forward and we look at these things, we find that you have things like these, these are spark lines, right? Spark lines are just basic trends. And these ones in specific are security trends. So like this one right here, this is other root activity. You see we had spikes. We had a couple of big spikes here and then flatlined. And you, you care about those spikes. You just quickly look and say, well, this doesn't look like it's supposed to, or this root activity doesn't look like it's supposed to, or this IDS over here is picking up traffic on a very irregular basis. And then you can able, you're able to pinpoint down into your logs what is causing that to happen. One of the best things you can do is tracking changes. So this is just port flapping over a 24 hour period, a seven day period, and a two week period. And we can find that we were able to knock down in all three categories the number of logs that we were receiving that had port flapping as the big message. You care about these because if you have a business guy that cares about trends and says, how are things doing? What's the health of our system? How does it look historically? You just pull this up and show it to him. Be like, this is what our logs say. It says that we're doing better. So this is our kind of our, uh, our final slide, so we'll, we can have discussion afterwards. But the things that we've talked about today are really, really simple. They're the dead simple things, right? Searching for specific text and then bin and count. We group things and we count how many there are. We need more of the kind of cool stuff that the big data world looks at. So if any of you guys want to take part in the community, um, this is what we need. We need to get people seeing the rest of what's going on here. Because remember, we're just looking at logs as essentially a super grep, right? But there is so much more richness in this data set where we can say, are we out of the norm, right? Even in the bin and count, we can then draw linear regressions or we can do um, trend analysis to figure out, is this normal for this time of day, time of week, that kind of stuff. So we wanted to put in kind of a shout out saying, hey, you guys with stats cap capabilities, please, you know, start writing plugins, start, you know, presenting on ways to do this and share with the rest of us. Um, honest truth is, this is exciting enough to me that I'm actually going into a program at, at, um, at the U starting in the fall, um, their big data program, because I want to be able to do this kind of stuff and I don't have the chops just yet. Yeah. So you guys who do, start. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, these are the first tentative baby steps towards what will eventually become self-healing networks self-managing networks. This, this is the way you would do that. So, questions, um, things you want to go back on and discuss on or whatever. We've mm -hmm. got a couple minutes. <laughs> yeah. Minute or two, yeah. So, for scaling, have you guys run any problems with um, analyzed field types? Have you had to do any like custom mappings with doc values? Uh, we have done some. Uh, actually, well, we've done a lot. Um, so go back to the, um, yeah, just, go ahead and just, talk about just so it's there. So the architecture um, we do a lot of a lot of custom field writing actually in our stuff, um, and we do our own doc values and our own crunching. Um, one of the things you can do is you can put Bayesian filters. I don't know if you've tried that, giving values to stacked terms, which that's kind of a machine learning thing, but you can do as well. Now when you scale it and you have those on top of it, it actually scales pretty well because you just take that same configuration across everything and it's pretty well. But what we found that as we scaled out our master nodes and our balancer nodes there and we changed and we started spreading kind of like our, your sharding across it, if you got conflicting information, like if you had a, an old field and a new field together in the same index, they would start to compete with each other when you would do the analysis through Kibana. So you do have to kind of what, as you scale it, you should have pretty well set what all your values and your fields are before you really start to scale. Because if you have a really large cluster, like Tanner was saying before, one box testing, if you test on a large cluster, it clutters everything up, it chews up the amount of field cache you have, and limits the ability for it to parse through all of those things. So yes, yeah. there are problems with that. Um, just make sure you test it somewhere else. Have you tried using 
MySQL logs, database logs, so query logs, mm -hmm. and visualize database requirements? Uh, yes, yeah, we did that one for a little while. Um, we also did it with, um, oh, with, we were using Mongo logs, I think, is what we were using. Okay. But yeah, it actually, it actually worked really well. Um, the way that we were doing is we were pumping it into its own index, so it sat off by itself, and then we ran analytics on that index specifically off because we kind of have two clusters, one that's done for all those off non-production things, but yes, we have done that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and, and the, the, number, the more fields you have, uh, the less performance you're going to get, just like the, mo the more indexes you have open, the less performance you'll have. Uh, you need to take both of those into consideration, and that's where some of these redundant or slightly different fields becomes a mess as well with, uh, with performance. If you guys really want to have fun sometime, if you've ever played with the D3 libraries, um, it is possible to create network maps from just your logs because things do tell you what they're connected to. And so if you really want to go into advanced stuff, you use D3 and you can create node maps of your entire network. And it's kind of cool. It takes a lot of time, but it's worth it. Mm -hmm. Layer 2. Mm -hmm. The D3 library. Yeah, there to discovery. Yeah. Do you guys have a preferred tool to actually collect the data that you're putting into Logstash? <laughs> well, so there's there's going to be different opinions on this. He uses something different than I use, and he uses something different than I use. So um, we can go over all the logs. I like I like either having using the syslog listener or um, using um, Logstash forwarder. That's what I use. Yeah. Um, I really like using a pared down version of Logstash that does pre-processing on the system. If I can steal CPU time from the server it sits on, rather than all my backend stuff, I save my cluster the compute that is really heavy. So I break it out and I put a pared down version of Logstash on each of my boxes and have it read it direct from a file, then fire it over. Mm -hmm. Or a little collector node. So you've got large numbers of servers or types of network devices. They go to a centralized location where there's the pre-processing, then they join the system. Um, so on and so forth. So you can have little intermediate steps if you've got a large number of servers or, or devices to deal with. Uh, and there's also things like Lumberjack, which work pretty well. Um, there, are four, there are really four or five of those kind of log tailor kind of tools, including Windows log grabbers. Um, yeah, so you just pick one. Yep. Have you done anything with like database logs, uh, query logs, slow query logs, general query logs? They're in there. Yeah, they're, 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 they seem to perform okay. You just need to get the right grok parsing. Mm. And you can also use um, grep as well. Mm. So after you do grok parsing, you can do grep. You can do a number of different methods for parsing things within Logstash, and you can do multiple cycles through um, before it gets sent off to Elasticsearch to be as sophisticated as you need to be. So really what it comes down to, as long as you have a text-based file that just has text on it, you can parse it. So as long as you know already what the basic layout is, you can custom write your own parsing for it, pop it into your own index through this thing, and have it be kind of like a subgroup of everything else that's going on. Oh. And then you can create your pivot tables and whatever else you need on top of that, yeah. and monitor your database values as well as the server upon which the database is residing. Another question. What about yeah. giving like management access to Kibana to do some pivot tables on data? Uh, we, do, we actually have that now. The, uh, the OIP sponsor that we have is the vice president of OIT, so he's the one that really wanted, if you saw before, those kind of metrics of how do we look, are we, are we doing better than we did the week before. One of the things that they asked for was a custom report. They had Event Tracker, which created just an Excel table of just values. I mean, are, are we, how high are we compared to last week, the month before, whatever, all the that stuff. Percentage up and downs, like the Kibana graphs. Now, if you look up here in the corner. It's coming back. Coming back to life here. There's a, this custom alerting section here. We wrote our own um, API interface for it that would go through and create those graphs and maps that were specifically just for them. So they didn't. They don't care. Usually, upper management doesn't care to monkey yeah. with the pivot tables. They just want information. So what we would do mostly is ask them what they want and create the report custom yeah. for them. So they could just go to a web page and be like, "That's all I cared about." Yeah, you can create a custom whatever you want as long as you can talk with the REST API and you handle the security implications and access control. You can bypass Kibana entirely and present something just for them. Um, yeah. Uh, I think I heard you mention OpenTSDB at the beginning. Like yeah. What, what so kind of use case yeah, would you want to bring that in and so instead of Elasticsearch? Well, they're, they're different, right? Elasticsearch is about logs. Right. OpenTSDB is about time series numerical metrics. So we're actually replacing our Navios and MRTG servers with an OpenTSDB cluster. And I should give another talk on that, and it's really awesome. <laughs> but yeah. 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 So they're kind of different use cases. 
And, and the honest truth is, is that it, I always think of it like this. You've got two eyes for a reason, so you can have three-dimensional vision. The same is true is if you have multiple ways of looking at your systems, you can see into corners that, one, that the, other side, the other eye can't see. Mm -hmm. An example would be you notice something weird is going on in the logs, but you can't pin down exactly what it is. Then you, uh, you send out your SNMP you requests or, or you dig in a Nagios or whatever else to, to look at it from another angle and find more specifically what's going on. We're at time, but question. Yeah, we'll keep answering until it kicks out. Yeah, are there any sort of data sources you find are particularly problematic for bringing in? Problematic in like the parsing, or problematic in that it's not standard, or? Um, well, I, so I, I'm totally a novice at this. Uh, um, um, at this so I'm just wondering if, if there's any types of things that are, are more difficult to, to bring in. Yes. Yes. Oh, that is a moving target because it changes with time. As people come out with pre-existing Grok or Regex patterns that handle things, you just drop it in and it's fine. But anything that doesn't follow a standard exactly is going to be a problem. When you go look at, if you go look at logstash.org, they're pulling everything into elastic.co. But logstash itself has like 50 input modules. Types, yeah. And like 50 output modules and like... 10 or 20 different codecs. I mean, it's got all these different ways you can slice and dice and pull. You can pull data from tons of places. Not yeah. just tailing lots, what I happen to be doing, but you can pull it off of Kafka bus. You can pull it off of you know, tons of places. So, all that, kinds of stuff. so the real answer is really anything that there's not a predefined parse for that you have to write your own is the most difficult one. Keep in mind, it's a lot of regex. So if you're lucky, someone's written it for you. If you're not lucky, if not, you have a bunch of Cisco thank, ASA logs and stuff like thank that. Thank goodness for Grok. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess that's all we have time for. But uh, thanks, guys. Yeah. If you have any more questions, just come ask us after. Yeah. So in this same room.